speaker of this morning, um, whose last name I haven't uh, officially heard pronounced correctly, so I apologize if I mispronounce it. Frank Koshelski <laughs> is Academic Services Officer for the Interdisciplinary Studies Program at Wayne State. That means he serves as academic advisor, recruiter, sometimes instructor, and many years ago, starting in 1968, he was a student at Wayne. He has also apprenticed as a sheet metal worker, made a full-time living as a rock and roll musician, he plays both piano and guitar, and once ran a van conversion business. He worked as an automotive salesman and had become a mechanic by the time he returned to Wayne State in 1987 to earn a college degree. He went on to complete an MA and PhD in history, which he completed 10 years later. Today he is joined by Scott Gwinnell, and uh, another Wayne State graduate and a jazz composer about whom Dr. Koshelski will be speaking about in his talk, Music in the Post-Industrial City, Detroit's Cass Corridor, a Jazz Retrospective. <laughs> no, some of it's true. <laughs> oh. Figure out how to work one of these newfangled things. Oh, look, it's a CD. <laughs> So, hello everybody. You can hear me because I sound system, I think you have to talk loud to get people in the back of the room. Although, they're not that good looking. But, oh, anyhow. <laughs> My name is Frank Kuschelski. You did a great job on the pronunciation, I might add. This is Scott, Scott Gwinnell. He's a jazz composer, one of the best um, arrangers jazz composers and pianists in the city, has a 10-piece band, a four-piece band, and plays all over the place. Barely made it this morning, he had a late night last night. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about the post-industrial city. Uh, Scott Quinnell has written a suite of jazz music inspired by and dedicated to the cast corridor. Cass Avenue, for those of you who got lost coming here this morning, uh, is a street that Wayne State University is situated on and runs all the way from West Grand Boulevard to Congress, just past Michigan Avenue, and nearly to the Detroit River, which is about two miles. This street is legendary, famous, and to some people, infamous. Beginning at the boulevard with the Fisher Building, past Wayne State, into a somewhat blighted but still vibrant neighborhood, constantly changing with new and old construction, such as uh, barbecue restaurants, slows to go, churches, a bicycle shop, etc. Cass Avenue, like much of Detroit, certainly seen its ups and downs, but it refuses to go away. In the composer's notes, uh, that was Scott has a brand new CD that hasn't even been released yet, but we're going to try to sell it to you and get it to you later. That's why we're here. <laughs> In the composer's note, Scott says, if you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you are seeking poverty in a cast quarter, you will find it. You may even pass negative judgment and never give it a second thought. This is to your own detriment. I hope listening to this suite, showing my impressions of the area, will make you see it as in a different light. The cast quarter is spark. It is legacy, it is pain, guile, patience, optimism, and most of all, in my experience, duality. The Cass Corridor can be seen as a microcosm and metaphor for Detroit itself. Much like Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich or Joyce's Double Nurse, Gwinnell Cass Corridor Suite presents, some, represents something much larger. The past, present, and future of Cass Avenue, and by extension Detroit, exists here in this musical work. 
So we have Detroit in the post-industrial age, the pre-industrial age, the industrial age, and finally the post-industrial age. In writing the pieces for this work, Scott chose the Impressionistic rock. Rather than depicting landmarks and buildings, he chose feelings and emotions. Oh wait, there's only another 15 pages of this. <laughs> this work shares its characteristic with sweeps such as Karl Orff's Carmina Burana, Anthony de Vorjak's New World Symphony, and Ferde Rofe's Grand Canyon Suite. What Scott Pennell gives us in this work is at once a history of Detroit and music and mood through the lens of the Cass Corridor. So where is the post-industrial city? Well, it's here. But so is the early industrial city, the boomtown industrial city, the failed in industrial city. And rising from the ashes, sometimes literally, is the rebirth, the hope, the future, the post-industrial city. Make no mistake, being post-industrial does not mean the end of the city. No, it's just another chapter in, a, in a, yet another beginning. So what we're going to do now is play you small pieces of the suite uh, and um, with explanation of what they mean. One second here. And Scott has to prepare a little bit. That's what I'm doing. Thank, thank you, Frank, for a uh, very nice introduction. Um, as I said, I'm going to be playing uh, little deep, little bits uh, of my suite. Uh, it's uh, actually a 50-minute long suite in its entirety, and it's going to be released on a CD, but also premiered. Um, I'm not exactly sure yet. It's either going to be possibly here at the DIA, but. Um, you're going to hear little clips of the themes of each one of these. There's eight movements to the symphony, or symphony, to the eight movements to the suite, and um, it's written for actually a jazz sextet, uh, which is uh, tenor, sax, trumpet, alto sax, piano, which I'm playing, and bass and drums. So, um, like I said, it's there's eight parts. So I'm going to play for you the theme to the first part right now, and uh, for those of you who are um, music-minded, you'll recognize that this kind of has the, it takes on the same, um, same kind of sound as plain chant, or many of you know this Gregorian chant. Um, very plain, simple melody, no accompaniment, and uh, here we go. Yes, I'm sorry. 
Wait, okay. I'm going to sing it. You're going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. Do you play the seed in the computer? Yes. Everybody be patient for a minute. We have to, the technology has uh, broken down on us. Not surprising. <laughs> for some reason. I'm only going to be able to play, play bits and pieces of it, so um, give you a little teaser. What, um, what I was going for with, with this, this concept was a feeling, um, a more impressionistic feeling, like Frank mentioned. So keep that in mind when you hear each of these movements. Um, I'm not talking about places, certain things. Um, it's talking about like a general feeling. Um, the second movement is called Spark. Okay. And Spark is a, a catalyst or an inspiration to me. It was the shocking first impression of playing in the corridor and jolting me into a completely different world. <coughs> this happened when I was about 23 years old. I was actually going to school at the time. Um, I included multiple grooves to um, represent the new different experiences and change quickly just like everything that happened to me while I was down here. So this is the this is the second movement, this is the theme to it. It's called Spark. Legacy is to represent exactly what the 
it says. That's the, that's the uh, beginning theme of pain here. Um, the, next, the next part of the suite, uh, the fifth movement, is entitled Guile. Guile is cunning. Guile is a, and cunning is a quality that must exist in those who want to stay afloat in the rough waters of the corridor. This is my reflection of the street smarts that I saw in people um, and that I, quite, I experienced quite often in dealing with life there in the two years that I lived in the quarter. Uh, this movement actually, or this movement acutely turns melodic corners as if it was dodging something. Uh, with frequent syncopation, the melody rarely becomes comfortably standing. So, this is Guile.
is entitled Patience. Uh, patience is a necessity to be an artist residing in the corridor. Passionate about our vocations, many of us have put on hold security, relationships, and other life items that are often taken for granted by people to attempt to find their artistic voice. Uh, patience is my struggle and the quiet, confident anthem dedicated to, uh, to others like me and what they must go through to live there. Again, the melody picks up, there's an intro, so I just want to go right before the melody. Uh, emotions sort of uh, leak 
one into a survival and adaptability? It's this work is composed just this past summer and put together. And now when it's your turn to ask questions, I want one of you to ask, how did you raise the money for this? <laughs> because our, our part of the presentation is over. Yes? How did you raise the money? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is another, um, you know, we're talking about the new music business. We're talking about a business that's not centralized in large recording studios. We're talking about a business where the musicians actually have to sell their own stuff. And they have to provide the money to get the stuff. What Scott did, who's a genius, used uh, Kickstarter at kickstarter.com, for those of you that have your own projects, so that to raise money for this, and his original goal was $2,500. And of course, that was impossible to raise for a project as terrible as this, so he raised $4,500. <laughs> And the way Kickstarter works is that if you reach your goal, well, then they release the money to you, and otherwise they turn it back to the people who provided the money. So, so one way the Scott paid the musicians and paid um, everybody to put it together in Mac Avenue Studios, then agreed that since the work was done, the recording work was done, that they would do the pressing, the advertising, and everything else. The CD was supposed to be out by now so that we could sell them to you. Uh, however, it will not be out till um, February. February, January or February. But, of course, I brought along a sheet. If anybody wants to sign up, I'll take your name, email, address, and we can uh, let you know when, when the final product is done. Um, do, would you, do, it's your job. Tell them to ask questions now. Please ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions for Scott? About the composition? Yes. Mary? Well, you mentioned this was done at Mac Avenue Records. Can you tell us a little about, bit about what Mac Avenue Records is doing in the city? Um, yeah. In, in this in this case in particular, this is a. Uh, and uh, what it is, where it came from? Where, it, uh, where Mac Avenue comes from, <coughs> or the or its role in this record? Yeah, well, the role in the record and what Mac <coughs> Avenue is basically it came out of Detroit. And yeah. What's it doing here? Um, Mac Avenue, for those of you who don't know, is a, a jazz label that started out as um, it started as a it started out as a thought of uh, Gretchen Vallee, who's uh, the owner of Carhartt um, Carhartt Clothing, and she's always been a jazz fan. She's been a musician her entire life, and at some point she thought she like to get a jazz record label together. She also runs the jazz festival downtown on Labor Day. But um, up to this point, she's had mostly um, out-of-town national artists. And over the last year or so, she thought, you know, I want to get a label together for local artists doing what she considered important works. So she uh, contacted me and asked me to um, off of her agent contacted me and asked me to put something together for this, and this will actually be probably the, the flagship record on the on the new label. So she's an incredible patron of the arts. Um, if if you don't if you don't know who she is, but Google her name. She's an incredible. She's a giving person, and she loves jazz, and she's done so much for the community. It's incredible. More questions? Yes. Um, when you were talking about this kind of history going along of the cast, um, is there anything in it that talks about the name change? Or you know, because I meet new people that have come in and they never knew that you know that was the name of that area before. I mean, they were just calling it Midtown. Um, and you're talking about the survival and changing of the people there and saying, sure. and is that? Uh, <laughs> Reflected any of the movements, or um, I, I would, I honestly no. It's a little more general than than that. Um, it's it re really what it is is I, I kept a diary when I lived down here, and I every day every gig, and I had no idea it would ever come into use again, and I pulled it out um, six months ago. What were the years and, then? That uh, 2000 or not 2000, um, 94 to 90 or 95 to 97. I lived down there, and 
never thought I'd, I'd ever use it again, but I, I ran across them in the nostalgia box. And I started reading about all these gigs and all these feelings, and I thought, wow, what a, you know, I'm so far removed from that now. I live out in Harper Woods and have a beautiful um, partner. She's a, a great person. But at this, at this time in my life, I was single, living in a place with uh, no kitchen. My kitchen was a, a box fridge and a hot plate on it in the closet. Um, completely different mentality, practicing seven hours a day. All I had was my bed and the keyboard next to it. And I had walked to school all the way down the corridor. I meet people all the time. Um, and these were a reflection of my experiences, mostly documented through this journal, interpreted through music. But no, to answer your question, it's a little more general. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I hear stomachs growling. I think we are out of time. So uh, thank you very much for all that. And thank you for your attention.